Item number, SCP-430. Object class, Euclid. Special containment procedures. SCP-430 is to be kept in a humanoid containment cell on Site-17. Placed on a wooden pallet or equivalent loose support at least 20 centimeters above ground to prevent rusting. The cell containing SCP-430 is to be fitted with an adjustable table, a sand basin, a controllable two-position hook conveyor system, and a master-slave control system, as specified in Document 430 Gamma Construction Details. One cell adjacent to SCP-430 is to house a live D-Class subject, designated SCP-430-C, whose suitability was ensured by enacting Protocol Prometheus-11 prior to their internment. SCP-430-C is to be treated in accordance with Foundation Humanoid Containment Guidelines Section NP-1. Suitable SCP-430-C candidates are non-violent, introverted, and capable of carrying out simple tasks without supervision, with claustrophobia being a disqualifying factor. Other cells adjacent to SCP-430 containment are to be designated long-term low-value item storage. The set of cells adjacent to SCP-430 is designated SCP-433. While SCP-430 contains a living subject, designated SCP-432, such SCP-432 is to be treated in accordance with Foundation Humanoid Containment Guidelines, Section NP-5, except as following. Routine medical examinations of SCP-432 are to take place weekly, rather than monthly. SCP-432 is to be fitted with a heart rate monitor. Due to restricted movement, SCP-432 is to be fed an individualized diet, as per recommendations of a qualified member of Site-17 medical staff. SCP-432 is to be administered daily doses of aspirin to prevent vein thrombosis. SCP-432 is to be encouraged to perform light exercise within the limits of SCP-430's allowance. While no Foundation staff is present in the containment cell, SCP-432 is to have control of the table position, the lighting, and the hook conveyor system by means of the slave controller, unless deemed otherwise by staff of clearance 1430 or higher. This controller is to be disabled from the main control panel prior to staff entering SCP-430 containment. SCP-432 is to be explained the functioning of the controls, and be ordered to transport their cell above the sand basin prior to urination or defecation. The sand basin is to be cleaned daily. In the case of SCP-432 expiring, as represented by the lack of signal from SCP-432 heart rate monitor, coupled with visual confirmation, no personnel is to enter SCP-433 until visual feed confirms the presence of former SCP-430-C inside SCP-430. Subsequently, the remains of previous SCP-432 are to be removed from SCP-430, and the new SCP-432 briefed. Protocol Prometheus-11 Prior to being classified SCP-430-C, chosen D-Class personnel is to sign a printed copy of the following document. Note, following Incident 431, Personnel are to ensure SCP-430-C has signed the document with their own name. Researcher Eisenberg I hereby of my own will declare that I reject the divine mandate of our monarch, holding them to no more esteem than the lowest of peasants, for all men were born equal, and that I support, and urge my countrymen to rise against feudal tyranny, and fight for freedom, brotherhood, and equality. Undersigned. Description. SCP-430 is a cylindrical gibbet, approximately 3 meters tall and 0.7 meters in diameter, weighing CA-800 kilograms, composed of an unknown material. SCP-430 resists attempts to obtain bulk material samples, and attempts at indentation testing resulted in hardness values inconsistent with other properties. Vickers indentation test resulted in measured hardness values between 18 to 35 HV5, 
while subsequent attempt at sampling showed the bulk material being capable of causing significant abrasive wear of the diamond-coated cutting disc. Samples of surface corrosion are obtainable and are chemically identical to hydrated ferrous oxide. On the lower rim, the numerals 1772 and name Hans Dreschler are carved. While SCP-430 is occupied by a living individual, designated SCP-432, it persists in a passive state. SCP-432 can interact with their environment outside SCP-430, subject to the imposed physical constraints. Even if feasible for their size and dexterity, SCP-432 will deny having the ability to exit SCP-430. If forced to exit, SCP-432 shows signs of mental distress and reappears within SCP-430 within three hours of removal. SCP-432 shows no other anomalous properties or traits. Individuals within direct sight range of SCP-430 form false memories consisting of alleged reason for SCP-432's presence within SCP-430 in the form of a transgression SCP-432 has committed. The memories are consistent among test subjects. When SCP-432 expires, SCP-430 enters active state. During active state, SCP-430 attempts to locate a suitable individual in its vicinity, with a radius of effect expanding by CA 10 meters an hour, with unknown upper limit. Testing aborted after radius of effect exceeded 300 meters. A suitable individual Defined as one who has transgressed against laws and regulations of the royal city of City Council, valid during the period of 1766 to 1780, and who is within the effective range, will be instantaneously transported into SCP-430 through an unknown mechanism, becoming the next SCP-432. SCP-430 appears to show strong preference for individuals who have committed crimes against church or feudal authority such as blasphemy, treason, and poaching. Recovery Log SCP-430 was recovered from Western Germany, following a police raid on a compound owned by members of Dyson von Magdalena, or Sons of Magdalene, as a result of witness reports detailing Hans, a member of the task force, appearing inside SCP-430 after attempting to aid its previous occupant, who was wounded in the firefight and subsequently expired. A modified report detailing his death during the operation was published, and members of the task force were administered Class A amnestics. Addendum 431 Sons of Magdalene A fringe Christian sect led by a Johann Members of Sons of Magdalene venerated SCP-430 as a living manifestation of God's judgment and considered SCP-432 holy martyrs, usually providing them with drinking water, honey, and insects, as a reflection of the fasting of St. John the Baptist. In its original location, SCP-430 hung from the roof, behind the altar of the compound's church, with a sheet of worked sheepskin with the following inscription covering its lower half. For Mary Magdalene was sinful, but she knew of her sin and repented in the face of our Lord, and was thus blessed. And the scribes and Pharisees who brought her forth and willed to stone her, knew of her sin. But they were sinful, and did not know of their own sin, and thus were damned. And Lord Jesus said to them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And blessed were the men and women, for they learned of their sin, for they have walked the path of salvation. Addendum 432 Incident 431 On date expunged, SCP-430-C failed to appear with an SCP-430 following expiry of then-current SCP-432 even after one hour since event. 153 minutes after event, researcher A. Novikov disappeared from his office becoming the next SCP-432, with observers citing charges of sedition and less majesty. When interrogated, SCP-430-C admitted to signing the document with researcher A. Novikov's name, 
claiming to have overheard it from security personnel and citing, I never signed shit with my own name and not gonna start now as a reason. Examination of the signed sheet confirmed this finding. SCP-430-C was terminated on disciplinary charges. Researcher A. Novikov was provided with a computer and continued his work until death. Item number SCP-435 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures SCP-435-1 is to be kept in a secure warehousing facility that constantly provides SCP-435-1 a minimum of 1,000 lux illumination. Illumination must be provided by redundant lamps, operating from at least three parallel and independent power supplies providing generator and battery backups. Tests for integrity of the lighting system shall be conducted on a daily basis. In addition, Two mobile units capable of transporting SCP-435-1 shall remain on standby in the event of Contingency 435-XK-Alpha. No other special protective procedures are required to examine or test SCP-435-1, but research may only be conducted on SCP-435-1 with written O5 approval. At ground level, a secure perimeter is to be kept for 50 kilometers around SCP-435-2. A no-fly zone of 125 kilometers is to be maintained in the airspace surrounding SCP-435-2. At least two Foundation aircraft and one mobile ground station are to monitor the size and position of SCP-435-2 at all times. Should monitoring detect any growth of SCP-435-2 or any motion of SCP-435-2 relative to SCP-435-1 for a period in excess of 90 seconds, Observation teams are to initiate Contingency 435-XK-Alpha. No personnel are to approach within 100 meters of SCP-435-2, and Foundation security teams are authorized to take any action to prevent such contact. No research or testing is authorized on SCP-435-2 without explicit O5 direction. Description SCP-435-1 is a Type 3 iron meteorite weighing approximately kilograms, showing significant weathering. Spectroscopic and chemical analysis shows a composition over 99% iron, which at normal densities can only account for percent of the measured weight. Age is indeterminate, but analysis of weathering suggests it has been exposed to atmosphere for at least years. SCP-435-2 is an irregularly shaped object that currently has approximate dimensions of 15 meters by 12 meters by 48 meters. SCP-435-2 appears somewhat blurred in the visible spectrum, but computer-enhanced imagery in various spectra has shown a complex structure, showing a threefold symmetry along the longitudinal axis. Extending from the axis are long tube-like structures that share characteristics both with biological organisms, in particular, cephalopods of the order Teuthida, and with mathematical models of higher order fractals. These structures show undulating movements, even when SCP-435-2 is stationary. SCP-435-2 does not appear to have mass or inertia, and appears only to be visible due to refraction of light passing through it, and because of data expunged resulting in Cherenkov radiation of varying intensity. Any physical object with mass that comes in contact with SCP-435-2 will suffer an instantaneous change in velocity and direction away from SCP-435-2 without any loss in energy. This is apparently caused by being reflected through a higher order spatial dimension. If the affected mass is in a solid phase, this reflection will cause a change in topology that can result in either an inversion, turning inside out, a reflection, mirroring of all or part of physical structure, or a data expunged and high levels of gamma radiation. Because of these characteristics, it is currently impossible to directly affect SCP-435-2 with any means currently at the Foundation's disposal. However, it can be moved indirectly by moving SCP-435-1. SCP-435-2 maintains a fixed position relative to SCP-435-1 
as long as SCP-435-1 is sufficiently illuminated. Movements of SCP-435-1 have caused SCP-435-2 to move a proportional amount, maintaining a fixed distance and bearing. If SCP-435-1 ceases to be sufficiently illuminated for a period of time exceeding 8.3 moves, the behavior of SCP-435-2 will change. SCP-435-2 will enter an active state and begin random erratic movements orbiting the location of SCP-435-1. Average distance from SCP-435-1 will increase, and the apparent volume of SCP-435-2 will also increase. The rate of increase in both distance and size appears to undergo a geometric progression over time, and neither has been observed to decrease. This behavior will cease once SCP-435-1 is again sufficiently illuminated, at which point, SCP-435-2 will cease motion at whatever location it is at that moment, and remain there fixed, in relation to SCP-435-1. The threshold for this effect currently appears to be between 500 and 650 lux, and it appears that this threshold may increase by approximately percent whenever SCP-435-2 enters an active state. Because of SCP-435-2's interaction with normal matter, an active state is considered extremely dangerous. Passing through large volumes of air at speeds in excess of 500 meters per second dramatically increases levels of radiation, and if SCP-435-2 intersects water, or any land mass, data expunged. Any active state lasting longer than 90 seconds constitutes a potential XK-class end-of-the-world scenario and requires the initiation of Contingency 435 XK Alpha. Addendum 1 Recovery Notes SCP-435 SCP-435-1 was recovered in 1950 at location expunged. While surveying sites for testing, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers were directed to evacuate the native population from a small island, 85 kilometers from the proposed test site. They met heavy resistance from the local population. After evacuating the island by force, they discovered SCP-435-1 in a clearing, surrounded by several dozen burning torches. At this time, SCP-435-2 was not in an observable location, and the U.S. authorities had no indication of any anomalies. A survey crew was left behind, and according to subsequent interviews, when half the torches burned out, data expunged as a result of SCP-435-2 moving through data expunged before illumination restored to SCP-435-1. Foundation then took custody of SCP-435, and the U.S. government provided a cover story explaining that was the result of a having a higher yield than expected. Addendum 2 Interview with one of the village elders evacuated by U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in February 1950. Interview I-435-235 Interviewed Here and after referred to as subject Male 75 years of age Former resident of Recovery site for SCP-435-1 Interviewer Dr. Richards Forward Interview was part of background research on the history of SCP-435 prior to Foundation custody. Begin Log 1-12-1960-1430 Dr. Richards What do you know about SCP-4351? Subject The Skyrock Dr. Richards Yes, The Skyrock Subject there is a story to it. Dr. Richards, tell it to us. Subject. Long ago, when the world was only water and sky, there were two brothers. He who made light, and he who made dark. Like all brothers, they fought. One time, the light brother insulted the work of the dark brother. The dark one, he does not like this, and begins to destroy all the light in the world. He who made light cannot let this be, so he shoves his brother into a hole that goes outside light and dark, and plugs the hole with a rock. 
Because he who made dark can only see in the dark, he who made light puts the rock in a sling and throws it around the sun so it will always stay lit and the dark one will never see how to find his way out. Dr. Richards, that rock is SCP-4351. Subject, that is your name for the sky rock. Dr. Richards, yes, it is. How did it end up? Subject, long after the brothers fought, the Dark One's rock fell from the sky. It fell so hard that it broke the earth and raised the land and killed the first people who lived only in the sea. On the earth, the sun lit it only half the time, so when darkness came, he who made dark could see to find his way. Even so, he had been lost outside the world for many, many years. So each night, he only came a little closer. And each night the rocks shook and bled fire at his approach. The earth did not like this, so she made the second people to watch over the sky rock and keep it lit so that the dark one cannot find his way home. I think you may be the third people. Dr. Richards, so do you have any measure of how long you were keeping it lit? Subject, since before data expunged. Note, geological formations in the area suggest that if this is true, then habitation of predates known human populations in the area by nearly 10,000 years. Dr. Richards, shows subject a photo of SCP-4352. Do you know what this is? Subject. Y yes. Dr. Richards. Is it he who made dark? Subject. No. It is his shadow. End log. Closing statement. The non-material nature of SCP-4352 lends credence to the hypothesis that it is a projected effect from an unknown extra-dimensional entity somehow bound to SCP-4351. While dumping the rock into SCP and making it another universe's problem is tempting, it seems possible that the actual effect would be to only transport SCP-4351 without transporting the entity it appears to contain, releasing he who made dark into the material universe. Therefore, Contingency 435XK-Alpha is only a last resort. 05 Item number, SCP-458, Object Class, Safe. Special Containment Procedures, SCP-458 is considered safe, and therefore is to be stored in the staff canteen at Site-17, with no access restrictions required. Description, SCP-458 is a large-sized pizza box from the pizza chain Little Caesars of their hot and ready variety. It is made of simple cardboard, measures 25.4 centimeters by 25.4 centimeters by 2.54 centimeters, 10 inches by 10 inches by 1 inch, and weighs about 20 to 20.49 grams depending on toppings. As a result of the unusual nature of SCP-458, measurement of weight is inconsistent. What makes SCP-458 an oddity is that while appearing to be an ordinary pizza box, when it comes into contact with human hands, it instantaneously replicates within it the holder's subconsciously preferred choice of pizza, down to the favorite sauce, cheese, crust, and topping. It is not limited to the Little Caesars brand, as pizza from all major pizza chains, as well as local and even handmade pizzas have been produced. There seems to be no limit to its ability except that it cannot make anything but pizza, and its toppings must be edible by normal human standards. The box is also rather indestructible, as all tests to destroy or dismantle the box have proven fruitless. It is assumed the box is semi-sentient, having at least enough telepathic or empathetic ability to sense what the holder's personal choices regarding pizza are. After constant testing showed SCP-458's seemingly infinite power to generate pizza, but with little other use. It has henceforth been placed inside the canteen at Site-17 for free use by personnel. After its open usage has been allowed, personnel morale has shown to have sharply increased. Addendum 1A 
Upon testing SCP-458 with SCP- The subject took a bite of the slice, which appeared to be a garlic-free slice of sausage and olive pizza on wheat crust. This was met with the response, It's a fine slice, but I would have preferred a rather different sauce. It was inferred that the box cannot use substances that are indigestible by regular human bodies. Further testing confirmed this. Addendum 1B Document number 4581A I would just like to remind all staff that just because we have a pizza box that can constantly create pizzas for you does not mean that you can just sit around and eat pizza all afternoon. If continued abuse of the box continues, coupled with reports of personnel gaining unhealthy amounts of weight, I may be forced to implement a mandatory physical training regimen following lunch hours. Dr. Del Marino Document number 4581B For simple curiosity's sake, and to, perhaps, get a better idea of the mindset of certain SCPs, I have compiled a list of sentient SCPs' reactions when holding the box. SCP SCP-40 Result Small Extra cheese Cheese stuffed crust SCP SCP-56 Result Medium Sliced bell peppers Thin crust Alfredo sauce SCP SCP-73 Result Medium Feta and jack cheese No sauce Thin crust Note Almost immediately after opening SCP-458, the produced pizza began to go through symptoms similar to other organic material within SCP-73's effect radius. Experiment was retried, with the pizza being removed from SCP-458 immediately after its opening, with minor deterioration present. When queried by researchers, SCP-73 stated it had never ingested products created by SCP-458. SCP SCP-76-2 Result Large Meatballs Pepperoni Bacon Canadian Bacon Sausage Hamburger Thick Crust SCP SCP-105 Result Small Olives Wheat Crust Thin SCP SCP-108-1 Result Large Pepperoni Thick Crust SCP SCP-134 Result Small Onions Anchovies Olives Thin Crust SCP SCP-166 Result Small Bell Peppers Olives Thin Crust Note after SCP-166 ate a slice of pizza from SCP-458, SCP-166 complained about occasional moderate discomfort and nausea. The effects stopped after approximately 20 hours. SCP SCP-181 Result Large Pepperoni Sausage Marinara Stuffed Crust Note SCP-181 was told that this was a reward for good behavior, and that it was a lucky guess that it was his favorite type of pizza. SCP SCP-182 Result Medium Olives Mushrooms Pretzel dough crust SCP SCP-343 Result Large Almost every topping imaginable with over 100 distinct foods identified. SCP SCP-378 SCP-378-1 Result SCP-378-1 produced a large thin crust pizza with pesto sauce, ricotta, mushrooms, and fried mealworms. SCP-378 itself could not activate SCP-458. SCP SCP-3301 Result Large extra cheese and pepperoni Wet when removed from box SCP SCP-3477 Result Medium Anchovies All instances produced identical pizzas with identically arranged toppings Subject 
Dr. Michaels. Result. Large Hawaiian tomato sauce, honey baked ham, pineapple, extra mozzarella cheese with Tabasco. SCP SCP 4504. Result Medium Egg Bacon Barbecue Sauce Base Thick Crust. SCP SCP 4999. Result Extra Large Half Supreme Half Pepperoni. Note SCP 4999 shared the pizza with D430276 who was suffering from end-stage renal disease. Notably, this was the same variety D430276 frequently shared with her late partner, and the first known case of SCP-458 accommodating a pizza which exceeds its volume. SCP POI-3445 SCP-5175-1 Result Wielding SCP-5175 POI-3445 produced large pizza with mozzarella cheese stuffed crust, a barbecue sauce base, bacon bits, bacon strips, ground beef, ham, pepperoni, sausage, and a dusting of crushed chili cheese Fritos. SCP-5175-1 contributed teriyaki sauce. Note: Through POI-3445, SCP-5175-1 claims to have never tasted teriyaki sauce. It emerged as a modern fusion recipe and is not traditional Japanese cuisine. SCP-5175-1 acquired a liking for the sauce after conversation with POI-3445, who regularly ordered chicken teriyaki at the marketplace at Steamtown's food court. Further testing on SCPs may reveal some odd characteristics about the SCPs themselves and is suggested. Dr. Crane Update Further cross-testing is permitted, but requires approval and supervision due to safety concerns. Dr. Item Number SCP-489 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-489 is held in a containment unit at Site-113. To prevent personnel accidentally bringing insect life into SCP-489's cell, a shower room has been established outside of the containment cell. Personnel will change into the clothes provided to them after cleaning. Testing with SCP-489 is limited to indoor spaces. Due to the potential of containment breach and site damage, at no point may insectile-based anomalies, including instances of SCP-831, be stored at Site-113. Description SCP-489 is a roughly dome-shaped conglomerate mass, consisting entirely of objects used to kill or repel insects, e.g. aerosol pesticide cans, bug zappers, fly swatters, footwear, and lighters. Each item is capable of independent autonomous movement, though they usually move along the ground as a whole when in motion. As of June 17, 2013, SCP-489 measures roughly 5 meters in height and 8 meters in diameter at the base. There is a badly damaged transit van in the center of the mass, which contains a human skeleton sitting in the driver's seat. The skeleton's ribcage has been crushed. A faded, scratched logo can be seen on the right side of the van, which reads, Extreme Extermination Sick Services We'll bash any bug, big or small. 1555 Bug Bash. When an insect of any species comes within 5 meters of SCP 489, SCP 489 will surge towards the animal and attempt to kill it. Of note is that SCP 489 is heedless of other non insect organisms, should an insect be on or nearby them when attacking usually resulting in severe injury or death should said organisms fail to move in time. However, due to the number of objects moving at once, SCP-489 often fails to reach the target at all, instead having individual parts impede one another's movement. If SCP-489 fails to kill the insects, individual items on SCP-489 become hostile to one another and begin hitting objects adjacent to them. When not in the presence of an insect, 
SCP-489 is relatively docile, making study of it easier. Should SCP-489 successfully terminate an insect, objects capable of handling it safely, e.g. tweezers, shovels, etc., will retrieve and pass the insect along the edge of SCP-489, towards the storage space of SCP-489. During this time, it becomes possible to see the transit van without imaging due to items moving out of the way to open the doors. The storage space of the van in SCP-489 possesses extra-dimensional properties, containing dozens of rows of glass jars stored on wooden shelves. Every jar is full of various dead insects. If presented with new objects that would be considered bug killers, SCP-489 will readily attempt to incorporate them into itself. However, this habit makes its goal of exterminating insects even more difficult with the newly acquired mass. Newly added items immediately show signs of sentience. When new items are introduced to SCP-489, other items will enter the van's storage space and bring numerous jars containing disproportionately large specimens to the front of the storage space. These samples appear to serve as trophies for SCP-489. Each jar is labeled with a date and how the insect was obtained. Newly added items will gather around these jars in apparent admiration. Here is a list of several specimens SCP-489 has presented. Description: Three beetle-like creatures each measuring 1.5 meters in length. The abdomens are covered in large, thorn-like protrusions. The Savage Spine-Shooting Beetles Obtained July 7, 1989 The beasts were terrorizing the village of Lathos in Thoazola, brought down with the help of Julie and her garden gang. Description A thin, knobby, elongated creature resembling a stick insect, with an additional six pairs of legs. Each leg measures roughly 2.5 meters. Body length is roughly 5 meters. The Walking Lance Obtained December 20th, 1984 Found roaming the jagged rocky mountains of Jerinth. Its bladed legs felled Karen and Matthew before a well-aimed shot from Maxwell skewered its head. Description A horseshoe crab-like creature with prominent mandibles, paddle-like legs, and several sack-like growths lining its back and underbelly. Length Roughly 2 meters. The Aquatic Venomous Floater Bug Obtained March 26th, 1987 A new challenge. One that took place beneath the waters of the Burmese Swamplands. We have the scars to show for it, but the beast fell after the puncturing of its venom sacs. Description A humanoid entity 1.8 meters in height, with eyes and proboscis resembling a housefly. Musca Domestica. The Bug Man. Obtained May 5th, 1991. Found within the frozen hills of Russia. Well worth the battle and losses. Theo and the Torch's sacrifice will be honored by all bug killers for eternity. Description. An arthropod with four thick short legs, all spreading from its abdomen in a circle. Creature has large elongated pincers and a head featuring a prominent proboscis and compound eyes. Height, roughly 4 meters. The Bug That Killed Master Obtained November 18th, 2000 Master fought hard, but he had finally met a bug he couldn't kill. We fought for him and made it suffer, but we couldn't save our leader. Description A wooden case with several pinned, non-anomalous butterflies, beetles, and dried earthworms. Our first kills after Master's death, obtained from February to April of 2001. We will carry on Master's work. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.